So first, some thoughts on why we are here. On a certain level, I think this seems pretty obvious. The persistent pandemic and the ever accelerating dynamics of climate change seem to make abundantly clear that natural dynamics will be at the center of our political concerns for the foreseeable future. The effects of climate change, ever more frequent extreme weather conditions, floods, storms, rising sea levels, droughts, the acidification of the oceans, the extinction of countless species, the becoming uninhabitable of ever more parts of the earth, conjoined with the social disparity with which these effects hit people differently and exacerbate structural inequalities and violence, and I could go on and on, all of this makes it inevitable that there will be a politics of nature. At the same time, our failing coping and mitigation strategies make it clear that we are not yet equipped to adequately respond to these natural dynamics. Dynamics which are initiated by, but not in any effective way controlled by human self-determination. That much I think is obvious. What is far from obvious, however, is what an adequate response to the situation would require. And that is why we are here. The general assumption from which this conference starts is that the challenge is so fundamental that our response cannot be exhausted by technical solutions, ethical recommendations, or a ready-made list of political actions. We will turn to philosophy at this conference precisely because what is required is a fundamental questioning of modern human self-understanding and a fundamental rethinking of the political. This is a task that is philosophical in nature, even if mainstream academic philosophy has uh, failed to really confront it yet. To initiate a philosophical exploration of this fundamental task, we have invited our speakers here to develop philosophical perspectives on what has been called the Anthropocene, a description of our current age that highlights the fact that it is fundamentally changed, changed on the level of the Earth system, a new geological era. Despite all the worries one might have about the term Anthropocene, that it, has, that it in, implies a certain latent anthropocentrism and involves a problematic universalist appeal to the human, it seems useful at least to mark the fundamental, fundamental nature of the challenge of the various changes we are currently confronted with. And it makes plain that this situation calls for a reconsideration of our whole condition of existence, something that was in the olden days sometimes called the human condition. As you will be aware, the term Anthropocene is generally used to denote the fact that the Earth has been so profoundly altered by human impact that we have ex exited the Holocene, in retrospect now often described as a blessed period of stability, and have, a, have entered a new geological age. This geological age is named after the one who supposedly brought it about, Anthropos, um, but maybe it's more apt to say it is named after the one who is bringing himself or herself to an end in that very epoch. The justification for speaking about a new geological age is the fact that many of the changes it subsumes, erosion, the spread of sedimentation of new elements, global warming, sea level rise, ocean, ocean acidification, rapid changes uh, in the biosphere, that all of these changes will, and I quote the uh, Anthropocene Working Group here, will persist for millennia or, or longer and are altering the trajectory of the Earth system, some with permanent effect. The ICS has not yet formally recognized the Anthropocene as a geological unit, and it is still the object of considerable debate where to put the so-called golden spike. So where, where did it begin? Around the mid of the 20th century, as the AVG suggests, or at some different point. It won't be up to us to resolve these contested issues, interested as we might be in the arguments to go on one way or another, and also in the peculiarity of the diagnosis of a ge geological age before its traces even had time to settle. But leaving all this aside, I think we can take three key points from the discussion around the Anthropocene as a starting point for us here. First, the diagnosis that without the human proponents directly intending or understanding this, the impact has as of today, altered the Earth fundamentally and with a long-lasting effect that will impact any future human forms of life in ways we can't hope to anticipate. Secondly, this new age is connected to new kinds, new volatile kinds of natural processes that escape our usual grid. Distinguishing what is human-made and can therefore be changed and what is natural condition of our existence which cannot be altered or influenced. The process we are talking about are 
um, the processes that we are talking about are certainly in a certain sense human made without thereby being necessarily in our control or of such a sort that understanding our impact would imply we could stop or revert those processes. Natural necessity impinges on us no longer in the form of stable conditions one can rely on, but rather in the form of tipping points. Points, so that's the hard fact now, the tipping point. Points of no return beyond which we lose orientation. Necessity does not reside in the fact that things stay the same, but that they massively and irrevocably change at certain points we realize once it is too late. In a certain sense, we can say that this opens up a condition after nature. To quote Zizek, who will elaborate on this tonight in his keynote, I quote, devastating hurricanes, droughts, and floods, not to mention global warming, do they all not indicate the appearance of something for which the only appropriate term is the end of nature? Nature understood here in the traditional sense, a regular rhythm of seasons, the reliable background of human history, something on which one can all count always to be there. The third prompt we can take from the Anthropocene debate is the following. The severe changes on the way in this new age seem to potentially undermine the very conditions of human survival on this planet. These three things taken together, massive change, loss of control, and threat of extinction, should be enough to understand the urgency of our questions. But how in the world now should philosophy help us with this? The suspicion that we have and that we want to explore over the next two days is that any adequate response to the crisis we are in requires a serious rethinking of our own condition. This is true at least in three respects, regarding the causes of the current situation, the obstacles that make it hard for us to come to terms with it, and the remedies we need to respond. First, causes. Regarding the causes, the thought is that the crisis we are in has to do with a certain way in which we have practically and theoretically conceived of ourselves and have misconceived our life on this earth and our position in the world. One might say we have disregarded the first question, life on this earth, in favor of the second, uh, um, our position in the world, and thereby ironically also fail to give an answer to the second question. The modern dualism of subject and object, spirit and nature, has informed our self-understanding and our practices in such a way that our subjective freedom is thought of in terms of our mastery over nature. On this understanding, nature figures solely as resource and property. If that is what it is, it is only logical that we should only relate to it in the mode of appropriation, use, and abandonment. This setup, however, from the very start fails to acknowledge the extent to which we are natural beings ourselves, part of nature, as one likes to say, and dependent on certain natural networks and equi equilibria for our existence. If we want to overcome the current regime, we thus have to theoretically and practically we conceive of the relation of subject and object, spirit and nature, freedom and necessity. There are many different strategies to reach this end, uh, I suppose, and I gather we will see quite different options discussed here. Some more on the side of monism, I'm looking at the spinocists in the room, um, emphasizing that any presumed split between spirit and body ultimately has to give way to the one and only, Deo Sive Natura, some more on the side of a dialectical conception that emphasizes the irreducibility of the difference but requires a deeper mediation of nature and spirit. On this account, the liberation from nature that characterizes spirit cannot be won by dominating or exploiting nature. Spirit's liberation from nature entails, as Hegel already explicitly says, the liberation of nature itself. According to the Hegelian Marxian tradition, this deeper mediation the naturalization of the human and the humanization of nature can only be attained through our social relation to others and by actualizing ourselves as political beings. Let me quote the early Marx on this. I know most of you will know the quote, but it's just too beautiful to not uh, have it here. <clears throat> so quote, the human aspect of nature exists only for social man. For only then does nature exist for him as a bond with man, as, as his existence for the other and the other's existence for him, and as the life element of human reality. Only then does nature exist as the foundation of his own human existence. Only here has what is to him his natural existence become his human existence, and nature become human for him. Thus, society is the complete unity of the human with nature, the true resurrection of nature, the accomplished naturalism of the human and the accomplished humanism of nature. 
quote end. I gather we will hear some more on this by Christoph Menk, who will talk about the humanization of nature, Jacob Blumenfeld, who will talk about the socialization of nature, and Karen Ng, who will talk about rethinking species being. No matter if we pursue a monistic or a dialectic response, it seems to me that we have to avoid two mistakes here. On the one hand, to just reiterate and reformulate the notion of human rule over nature in a different guise. I think this notion is still applied in the very idea of the Anthropocene, that we are the driving force of, this, uh, um, of this, these changes. There's a certain pride that goes along with that term. And also expressed in the well-minded aspiration that human beings should become guardians of all life on Earth. On the other hand, it seems equally hopeless to take recourse to a romantic picture of an immediate harmonious unity with nature to which we shall return, which seems to fail to do justice to the current changes and to nature's sublime indifference to us. Zizek has once said that if there's one good thing about capitalism, it is that under it, Mother Earth no longer exists. Instead of such an immediate harmonious unity on the one hand and the idea of a domination of nature on the other hand, we require, as Walter Benjamin once put it, conscious political articulation of our relation to nature. So not mastery over nature, but mastery of our relation to nature. I think this is precisely the space that a new politics of nature would have to open up. Second point, obstacles. There's a second respect in which much thinking needs, uh, seems in order. Thinking about the ways in which we, even in acknowledging the current situation, find ways to avoid truly grasping it. I'm not simply taking, talking about the fact that, uh, that we all know what's going on but fail to uh, change our way of living. Some weakness of the will on the one hand and a lack of both individual and collective power over structural issues could suffice to explain this. But it also seems to me that we find it hard to actually understand our situation in adequate terms. Even those forms in which we try to acknowledge the situation in its severity seem guided by models that could turn out to be misleading. Let me just mention three examples. Austerity, tragic irony, revenge of nature. We often think of the current situation as one in which we have given in to a form of excessiveness and wastefulness, and think a way out could lie in restraint and austerity. But this continues to understand nature as a resource and just recommends to impose a different regime of its exploitation. As Oksana Timofeva suggests with Bataille in solar politics, maybe there's another notion of excess that is irreducible to making nature our comrade. Second example, we sometimes think of our current situation in tragic terms, as if humanity were a tragic hero who has doomed herself with diligence and effort, but in a sense without properly knowing what she was doing. Humanity meant well, but all the same dug her own grave. The tragic model implicitly invites us to take the position of the spectator of this tragedy that can be relieved or edified by seeing this. Is this, in fact, our position? And doesn't this involve a sense of fate that is misguided in this case? Thirdly, there is the notion that what we encounter now is the revenge of nature. As Engels famously had it, let us not flat out, I quote him, let us not flatter ourselves too much with our human victories over nature, for every such victory she takes revenge on us. I like that but it involves a certain anthropomorphization of nature in which she becomes an interested agent that can be aggrieved and gets pissed. I mean, she would be right to be, but is she? I mean, and is it a she? I don't know. So is it a person? Maybe thinking about nature's reaction as revenge is a way to avoid acknowledging uh, the sense in which nature as such does not care about us. Both the sense of tragic irony and the notion of revenge provide us with a strange aesthetic satisfaction that is absent from enduring the mere indifference and volatility of nature. To borrow Blanchon's famous phrase, the apocalypse we actually uh, get is disappointing. Now, third, remedies. Finally, regarding the remedies, this too definitely involves uh, a task for thought. Of course, there are many things we know we need to do, uh, to do uh, we, we know we need to do, and it would be crazy to diminish the importance of focusing right now on getting them done as quickly as possible. However, I don't think that this excludes, but can rather go along with rethinking the political. To develop conceptions of new, a new politics of nature that allow us to reappropriate our changed relation to nature and to make this very relation the object of political struggle, and thereby also to accord to nature a different kind of agency that goes beyond serving as property or resource for human exploitation. 
To make progress in this regard, we have to rethink the relation of the natural and the political, and we have to determine who or what the subjects of a political, politics of nature can be. In the first regard, it can be noted that the traditional understanding of the political is profoundly shaped by a fundamental opposition of society and nature, of a presumed realm of freedom on the one hand and a realm of external necessity on the other. We like to base our discussions on a contrast between what can be the subject of political decision and negotiation on the one hand and external conditions that escape our grasp on the other. It is a reflex of critical thinking to always distrust the alleged force of simple facts, uh, uninfluenceable frameworks and the rhetoric of no alternative. One tries to show that the constraints, frameworks, and lack of alternatives are humanly constructed wants to identify those responsible for them and break through the pretense of their unchangeability. However, such a critique comes to nothing when applied to the natural dynamics we are currently dealing with. The fact that we are dealing with human-made dynamics does not mean that we can simply turn them off. We have triggered processes that will haunt us for centuries or millennia and that can neither be easily controlled nor reversed by offers of negotiation. In the current pandemic, we have seen nicely the kinds of problems we run into when we behave as if we could negotiate with a virus about the distance that we should be in, maybe it gives us another half a meter. So uh, I think we have to readjust to nature as a realm of politically influenced and politically effective processes and agents that we have to include in our political processes as active political forces without being able to treat them as political actors of the classical type. Now, as to the question of the new subject of a polit politics of nature, it has often been noted that the presumed subject of the Anthropocene, humanity, is not a political subject that could be compared to, let's say, the subject of the bourgeois revolution or the proletariat. If that subject would indeed exist, it would seem to lack the counterpart that could render its self-determination a political act. In addition, it seems questionable that this presumed subject of the Anthropocene, humanity as such, in fact exists. The notion that humanity as such is responsible for the Anthropocene flies in the face of the great disparities between different times, nations, classes, and life forms as to their responsibility for the current changes. Likewise, not all humans are equally affected by it right now. So there's in fact a much more div divided picture. On the other hand, it seems true that this political struggle is one that does concern the possibility of humanity as such. So who or what is the political subject that can articulate the politics of nature? And what is the logic of this new political subjectification? How do we get politicized in, in whose name? In the name of humanity, life, the earth, the planet, 